Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Michael Hicks. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland and the CTO of Correct Computation. And I'm really pleased to be chairing today's panel on web security. We have three fantastic speakers lined up for you today. The first is going to be Charlie Rice. He's the tech lead for Chrome Security Architecture within Chrome Security. Then we have uh, Andreas Rosberg, who is a principal researcher and engineer with Dfinity. And we have Ben Livschitz, who is a reader at Imperial College and the chief scientist for Brave Software. So each speaker is going to spend about 20 minutes uh, presenting their remarks. We'll do all of the Q&A at the end, but you'll have an opportunity to type questions into the team chat or on the YouTube feed, and we'll gather all of those up and then deliver them at the end as, as part of an overall discussion. Uh, you also will be able to ask live questions. You can use the raised hand feature. It's in the upper part of your Teams panel. And uh, this, of course, will be at the end. Then I'll recognize you. You'll be able to unmute yourself, and then you can ask your question. OK, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, Charlie is going to be our first speaker. Charlie Rice is the tech lead for Chrome Security Architecture within Chrome Security. He's worked on Chrome's process model and navigation logic since 2008 and led the design and implementation of site isolation in Chrome. Before joining Google, he completed his PhD in web browser architecture at the University of Washington in 2009. Charlie, take it away. Great, thanks for the introduction. So in today's talk, I'm going to be covering some of the recent architecture work we've done in Chrome to try and make the browser safer for users. Uh, and in particular, covering the site isolation work we've done over the last several years. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to try to cover three themes. Uh, the first is some of the challenges that we face taking research ideas for browser architecture into production. Uh, the second is aligning uh, the importance of aligning the security model of a system, like a browser, with mechanisms that the OS and hardware can enforce. And third, the role of evolving the platform itself, like the web in our case, to better match what the architecture can safely support. And all this is pretty important because for the web, there's a, a very ambitious promise, right? That it should be safe for you to visit any website in your browser. And uh, you have to think about what information you give it, or if it downloads something, what you do with that. Uh, but just clicking a link should be a safe thing for any user. And this is despite a lot of very uh, important caveats about how the, the browser itself is built um, and how the web works. Like the fact that visiting a site is really running a full-blown program from a potential adversary. So you're running untrustworthy code on the client. And the browser is going to compile that code down to native in an aggressively optimized way uh, to try to make it run as, as fast as possible. This is going to happen in a bunch of different complex formats that are difficult to parse, HTML, JavaScript, a bunch of media types, and all sorts of formats in between. And we're going to do this in unsafe C++ code. Uh, at least we're stuck with that in terms of the rendering engine. Uh, because it's very difficult to rebuild a rendering engine from scratch uh, due to all the, the legacy compatibility constraints. Oh, and we're going to keep adding features all the time uh, to the web platform that might interact with each other in unexpected ways. So this leads to a very difficult situation for trying to uphold that promise about keeping it safe to visit any site you want. And as a result, there will absolutely be bugs in the system and exploitable bugs, uh, memory bugs and so on. And so I, I definitely want to be clear that finding and fixing these bugs is extremely important. And just a good portion of the effort on Chrome security is about finding all the bugs we can with fuzzing and vulnerability rewards programs and things like that, and getting those fixes out quickly to users. But the point I want to make here is that limiting the damage that these bugs can cause by your architecture is equally important, because these bugs will happen, and they will happen after the software is already in the hands of your users. And so in that sense, we really depend a lot on the architecture of the browser to make that promise of the web possible. And obviously, this goes back a long way with uh, the way Chrome has always been designed, uh, using things like sandboxes to uh, move away from monolithic browser architectures where everything ran in one process, and one bug meant that uh, all bets are off, the, the user might uh, have malware installed on their machine, to a multi-process sandbox rendering engine 
uh, where at least if there's a bug in the code handling the untrustworthy content from the web, it's much harder for that to get out and affect the user's machine. And we can get a lot of mileage out of this uh, sandboxing thing with uh, other types of content. So we were able to get the Flash engine inside the sandbox as well, so that that content would have a harder time attacking your machine. Much more recently, we've split the whole network stack out of the browser process on most platforms, and we're starting to get that into a sandbox as well, which is great because there's a lot of untrustworthy content that is being parsed in the network process. But even with all that, it still ultimately doesn't match the security model for the browser, that it's not a good match for the same origin policy that says that different documents uh, can should not be able to access each other. So as long as we have things like cross-site iframes and pop-ups that can live in the same renderer process, we don't have a great boundary between websites. And this is something that we've always wanted to fix. Uh, we knew early on that we wanted to be able to split up the rendering engine uh, to have dedicated processes for each site. But unfortunately, this isn't as easy as uh, just making the browser multi-process. Whereas the first step was really just porting an existing rendering engine like WebKit to run on a new platform, uh, which is inside the sandbox and talking to the browser process over IPC. For this, you really have to decompose the way the rendering engine works. So there's quite a bit more work required for this. And this is where I get into this notion of taking ideas from research and trying to get them into production for users. Uh, in our early research papers with Chrome, we pointed out we wanted to do some of these, um, this decomposition of the rendering engine. Uh, other research groups as well explored prototypes like Gazelle and OP, looking at how we can make browsers multi-principal. But to get that to work in practice, we actually have to go and, and do a lot of work on the rendering engine. And out-of-process iframes is really the, the biggest part of that. Uh, the rendering engine itself thinks it's responsible for all frames in a page. And to put a frame in a different process uh, requires a lot of work. So we couldn't even begin that work until we forked WebKit to have our own copy called Blink. And then we could start changing the, the rendering engine to be frame-centric instead of page-centric. And this, of course, affects a lot of core functionality. Uh, the way you navigate from one document to another in any frame, that might now be cross-process. Uh, as you're painting a web page, you now need to take textures from several different processes and composite them together outside the render without leaking textures uh, to a parent frame that might want to spy on those. Um, know where to send input events uh, by doing hit testing in the browser process, things like that. There's a lot of things that change in the architecture just to make this plausible to begin with. And that's just the beginning, because then there are tons of features in the browser that assume that all of the frames in a page would be in the same process. And you know, I've got plenty of stories about fun things in here with um, accessibility or printing or uh, find in page where you're, the code in the rendering engine thought, OK, I'll just do a loop over the frames and, and find the content I'm looking for. And now it needs to collect partial results from several different processes that might come out of order or have a crash process. You're basically turning these into little distributed systems that have to deal with these partial results. And so there's a lot of work that goes into this. And this took quite a while. This was uh, over five years of effort to update the browser fully for this. Um, almost half a million lines of code in Chrome changed. And uh, we've, of course, learned a lot of lessons along the way about doing a large scale project like this. But it was important to find useful milestones along the way uh, to get some of this out before everything was updated. Uh, it's interesting to see that a lot of this architecture work was really appreciated by the rest of Chrome team for sort of updating these legacy architectures that we inherited uh, and having clear abstractions around frames and documents. And that it was important to keep the goals clear over a multi-year effort to say, look, ultimately, we're going to get to where we can help enforce the same Oregon policy with the sandbox. And we did get to where we could have dedicated renderer processes without a process iframes. Uh, and it's interesting that even that is not quite enough, because you have to think about what each process itself is still allowed to access. Then on the web, you have uh, the web pages have this ability to ask for sub resources, images, JavaScript files, CSS from anywhere that they want. And 
what you don't want is an attacker's page to say, oh, I'm just going to ask for an image that happens to be your bank account homepage and has your account information in it. And it doesn't work as an image, but that data is now in the renderer process. So we have to be able to keep out the resources with sensitive data, things like HTML, XML, JSON, PDF, and so on, that are cross-site, while still allowing through things that the web needs to work, JavaScript and uh, media and so on. And unfortunately, even that is not as easy as it seems because the web is kind of a mess. Nobody labels their content types properly, so it's hard to tell whether something is blocking or not. Uh, so for example, we see a lot of JavaScript files like this, which claim that they're HTML in the content type, even start with HTML comments, which is not valid JavaScript, but the JavaScript engine helpfully ignores it. And so we have to make compromises and say, okay, so if something could run as JavaScript, we need to let it through. And we try and protect as much as we can. So it's sort of a best effort approach, but it's, it does end up letting us keep a lot of uh, sensitive cross-site data out of the render process. And so we end up uh, actually being able to make render bugs a lot less harmful. Uh, we were able to ship site isolation on desktop for all sites in 2018. A year later, we shipped it on Android for some sites, the, users, the sites that users log into. Uh, we're a little bit more constrained by memory on, on those platforms, but we're always hoping to, to increase the coverage there. And this means that uh, a bug in the rendering engine, a fully compromised render, has a lot harder time accessing cross-site valuable data. And so that's really good for the architecture and it, it makes us less concerned about some of these bugs. And we have our, our eyes on that goal of actually lowering the severity level for render compromised bugs uh, from high to medium. And we're not quite there yet because site isolation isn't quite on for all use cases and, and so on, but we're, we're hopeful that we can get there. And all of this sort of speaks to that idea of aligning the browser security model with things that can be enforced by the OS and by hardware. The site isolation was, was motivated by this goal to have processes be a backstop for bugs in the browser. And it turned out that this was a lot more important than we thought. Uh, when Spectre came along, that changed a lot of assumptions and made it clear that this actually is even more important. That Spectre showed that all of the work that CPUs do under the hood to try and be as fast as they can uh, unfortunately can leak some uh, secrets that they didn't intend to, that they might try and run things in advance. And if it wasn't uh, correct uh, because they made incorrect predictions, they would throw away that result, but it ends up in the cache and you can leak that via side channels. This of course ends up breaking rules of safe languages because now untrustworthy code can use a trick like this to access any address in its address space. And that matters in platforms that assume that those safe languages would not leak information. And sadly, there's lots of ways that CPUs try to do this aggressive uh, predictive behavior. And you end up with just whole categorizations now of transient execution attacks uh, that can leak data like this. And the thing that really hit home for us is that these attacks, unfortunately, work from JavaScript. Uh, that there are proofs of concept showing that you can run this from JavaScript, no bugs in the browser required. So that was, uh, you know, whereas we were motivated by uh, having a second line of defense when there are bugs in the browser, this matters even when there's not a bug. And what we found was, uh, as we worked with other browser vendors, um, it's difficult to mitigate Spectre in the browser using other techniques. So we talked about uh, removing precise timers, trying to make it hard to do the, the timing attack to reveal the data um, by adding jitter and then removing things that can implicitly be used as timers like shared array buffers. Unfortunately, this ends up just not being effective. Uh, it's possible to produce effective attacks uh, with extremely coarse grained timers. And it's also harmful to the web platform. We would like web applications to have precise timers to be able to do interesting things. So it's, it's not a great direction for the platform if we went that way. So then things like JavaScript teams uh, started looking at, can we change the, the JIT compiler to not emit patterns that could be used for speculative attacks? And this was promising at first, uh, but it turned out that just there are too many variants of these sorts of attacks to prevent this. And in particular, there's certain variants like uh, Spectre v4 that just are not amenable to compiler mitigations. 
the VA team actually has a great paper on this called Spectre is Here to Stay. It kind of lays out uh, a good argument for why they didn't think it was possible to maintain this. And so we're left in this world where we kind of have to assume that an attacker with JavaScript has full access to the address space of its render process. And interestingly, this is what we were assuming anyway with site isolation. We assumed that the attacker had a bug that could have a full arbitrary code execution within the renderer process. And so we were trying to keep data we're stealing out of reach of that sort of attack. And now this is effective against same process variants of Spectre as well. And it speaks to that idea of aligning your security model with what the OS and hardware can help enforce. And you know, in fact, we're even more reliant on it because there are cross-process variants of Spectre-like attacks, like Riddle and Fallout, where you can attack things on an, uh, another hyper-thread on the same core. And so we're reliant on the OS to say, uh, we don't want this rendering engine to share a core with another hyper-thread it might want to attack. And so it's important that we work together with OSs to, to have that sort of ability. And of course, this idea of aligning with the OS and hardware enforcement matters in many parts of the browser. You know, it matters for the quality of our sandbox as well. Uh, it's a great example with Windows 10 allowing us to uh, basically remove all Win32 APIs from within the sandbox, which greatly reduces our attack surface. So we've been really uh, happy to see that. But all of what we've learned from this architecture work and some of the compromises that we've had to make show us that it's also important to evolve the platform itself and the APIs that are available. So in this case, like making the web uh, better fit the architectures and the security guarantees we want to provide. And Chrome team in general has had some good luck toward some of these platform changes. Uh, we've been very successful in encouraging a lot more adoption of HTTPS, for example. Uh, it's you know, now getting to where HTTP feels archaic, feels like Telnet, like it should. Um, people shouldn't be sending things unencrypted. And um, now it's, it's much more the case that most sites default to HTTP, HTTPS. Flash is another interesting one. I never thought we'd actually get to where Flash would be deprecated and removed from the web. But we are now one month away from end of life with Flash. And that's a great sign that the platform itself has evolved to support those use cases and that the security headaches uh, from that uh, can be removed from the platform at some point. As well as adding new APIs that websites can use to secure themselves, whether that's headers like content security policy or changing the defaults for cookies to be same site by default, um, places where we can help improve the, the security of the platform for all websites. And as we tie that back to the site isolation work, there's a lot of these places where we had been constrained by compatibility that we would like to move the platform forward. Uh, I've been talking about sites here and not origins, even though the, the web security model is the same origin policy, because there are features in the web that allow you to change your origin at runtime within a site. So an origin is like mail.google.com with a uh, scheme and a port. And a site is more general. It's the registered domain name in the scheme. And document that domain allows you to change things within there. Now that usage is dropping off, and we're hoping that we can deprecate the whole feature and isolate things at an origin level, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And then there's the, the best effort aspects I mentioned with trying to keep data out of a render process. It'd be much better if we had a better sense for which data needed protecting for sites, or if we could just do a better job keeping things out to begin with, unless it was uh, allowed through explicitly. So some of the first steps we have towards that are making headers available where websites can better secure themselves. Uh, some of the headers you'll start to see uh, being supported now are things like cross-origin opener policy, where you can limit the scripting between windows. Uh, this is uh, nice because it allows for some aspects of process isolation, even in browsers without out-of-process iframes. Uh, so it's a first step toward site isolation. With cross-origin resource policy, that's one where sites can better label their resources to say, this has sensitive data in it. I really don't want it to end up in somebody else's renderer process. Or it doesn't have sensitive data. Feel free to allow other sites to use it. And then cross-origin embedder policy, which is kind of a fun one because it's the reverse. It's the I am an attacker header uh, where you're saying, I want to use powerful features like shared array buffers or uh, memory management APIs, things like that. So don't allow any other site's data into my process unless those sites say it's OK, that they acknowledge the risk. And these are sorts of things that 
we can evaluate how that goes and whether these are possible to, to move to be future defaults for the web. Um, there's similar work on, uh, like I mentioned, deprecating document.domain, making cookies same site by default, um, RFC 1918 for trying to better identify private networks and protecting their things. So we're hopeful that we can move the web in that direction. So overall, uh, we hope that this has shown it's important to have your system architecture back up your security model. With site isolation, we were able to take some of these ideas from research browsers and get them into the architecture of an actual shipping browser. Uh, it did require some compromises along the way, but we think it has set us up well to really offer a good path to protecting cross-site data uh, using mechanisms that can be enforced by the OS and hardware by the process boundary. And by doing this, we found places where it's still important to push the platform forward and have that solve that impedance mismatch between what the web allows and what the process model can support. So if I were to leave you with any calls for action, you know, think about your own systems architectures and uh, whether they align well with your security model and where that can be improved. And if you do have web applications, think about how to use some of these uh, headers and, and so on and help the web move forward towards safer defaults. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Charlie, for that interesting talk. Um, I see some questions have uh, started to show up in the chat. That's great. We're going to do Q&A at the end, uh, but please do type in your questions as we go. Uh, now let's move on to the next speaker. Andreas Rosberg is a principal researcher and engineer with the Definity Foundation. He was previously on the team for Google's V8 JavaScript virtual machine, and he was a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems. He's one of the designers of WebAssembly, the subject of his talk today, and he authored its formalization and specification. And at Definity, he's been working on deploying WASM, WebAssembly, for decentralized cloud computing and is the tech lead in the languages team. Andres. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, so yeah, the organizers asked me to say a little bit about WebAssembly and how it relates to security. So I thought I split the talk up into kind of two parts. One is just some basic design decisions we made with WebAssembly that are meant to maybe not provide security, but like enable security. And I want to, most of them are kind of like standard or probably not very surprising. So I want to focus on one particular feature of WebAssembly, namely its module systems and how that enables more like implementing security policies on an architectural level. Um, and you noticed here, I'm spelling WebAssembly in a certain way. Um, you probably have Often that's the official way to spell it. You often have probably seen it on the web spell it like this, all uppercase. Please don't do that. It's not an acronym. There's no reason to shout on the internet. Too many people are doing that already. Don't be one of them. So this is just my little site mission, which I have to build into every talk. Um, okay, so what's WebAssembly? Um, basically, it's a virtual instruction set architecture. So like a, v, like a CPU, but... Uh, virtual, right? Um, but its instruction set is very close to actual hardware CPU. And it's designed to be portable, that's a function of being virtual, and also fully sandboxed, which is something I want to talk about a little bit more later. Um, and it is meant to be freely embeddable in all sorts of environments, we uh, call them hosts. So there are many, um, oh, sorry, yeah. So in a nutshell, it's really like a virtual machine, but it's a low level virtual machine, um, meaning that unlike other virtual machines, you may be familiar with like the JVM or the .NET system, the CIL, um, it's not an abstraction over programming language, it's an abstraction over the hardware. So really almost most of the instructions in WebAssembly have a one-to-one -one correspondence with instructions you find on actual CPUs. Um, yeah, and it's, it's original, Intention, of course, was uh, for to be embedded in web pages, um, to be able to build web apps. But even at the beginning, we already kind of envisioned this being more general and should it should be possible to use it in various other environments. And so it was designed uh, very cautiously so that it's not dependent on the web in any way. And this worked out. We're seeing it already being used in various environments like the ones listed here. And as you can probably see uh, quite a few of them are sensitive to security concerns. So that is one basic design consideration as well to enable security in some way. So here's like a more complete list of goals and constraints that 
we defined for ourselves when we came, when we started designing WebAssembly, and I will not go through them, but here, like in that corner, you see some of the features that are relevant to security in some way or the other, and I will go through those a little bit in a little bit more detail. So, yeah, one basis for security is actually language safety, right? Um, so what does WebAssembly do for language safety? Well, very simple and obvious things, first of all. So one is that its memory uh, is bounce checked. So WebAssembly has just a certain way of treating memory. It doesn't give you access to the physical memory. It just has gives you access to some array of raw bytes, which you can index into with logical addresses. There's no way to for you to access physical addresses. And these accesses are bounce checked. So if you try to access outside the array, it, you will get a trap immediately. Um, another important feature is, and this is where you are getting a bit more high level than the actual like actual hardware, is that functions are a primitive concept in WebAssembly. And that, that allows us to completely encapsulate the, the call stack, for example. So there's no way to refer to that, no way to take the address uh, or anything like that, which obviously rules out all set of attack vectors that you often see in, in other uh, languages or environments. And there, there's no notion like a code point or anything like that. All that is not exposed at all to programs. And another feature of that is that registers, for example, are available in WebAssembly in the form of like locals. They're kind of virtual registers, but they're always local to a function. So there's no way to accidentally pass a value in some register to another function. Um, WebAssembly also is typed. So like all locals, registers, globals, and functions, they all assigned types, instructions are typed. And um, this ensures that there's no way to actually misinterpret a value, right? So unlike, um, unlike hardware, there's no way to, for example, mistake an integer for a pointer or something like that. Um, and so you can't, you shouldn't be able to abuse that either if you're a malicious code. Um, and this is ensured through a process we call validation. So every piece of WebAssembly code that you're going to execute is has first to be validated. Um, and that is a form of type checking if you want. So it checks that all the types match up, that you don't use undefined indices, that all the operands match up, the imports are provided in, in the right manner. Um, I'm going to talk about that later. And this is defined in terms of a, a type system. It's not just some random type system we made up. We actually, It's actually a type system that you can prove sound. So these properties are actually provable. Um, and then on the operational side of the semantics, uh, it's we we have a semantics that is almost entirely deterministic, meaning that there is no undefined or unspecified behavior in WebAssembly, unlike in other low-level languages like C, for example, where this is like uh, spreading like cancer. So everything is defined, well defined in WebAssembly, and everything is al almost everything is uniquely defined. That means that for almost every operation, you get a uniquely defined result. Result. There's just one exception, and that is. If you have a floating point op and that generates a NAN, we don't specify what the bit pattern is. And the reason here is that IEEE basically failed us. It doesn't specify it. And the reality is that CPUs just widely disagree on that. So we had long, long discussions in the beginning, like whether we should require to normalize NANs, but it turns out to be pretty expensive, which would kind of like harm some of the use cases for WebAssembly. But on the other hand, it's not difficult to normalize them if you want to. So for example, on, on the Definity platform, we also use WebAssembly and we, we depend on determinism because we're a decentralized system, so we need a consensus and so on. So it really everything has to be deterministic. So we just normalize all NANs and do away with this problem. So it's possible if you need it. Um, everything else except that is fully deterministic. Um, of course, you may wonder what, what about threads or something like that. So they are not yet in WebAssembly, although there's a pro proposal that is quite far along and it's already implemented in most engines. Um, but obviously there's some inherent non-determinism that provides, but still that non-determinism is completely isolated, not isolated, but restricted to specific instructions that access shared memory and you can control what memory is shared and what isn't. And as, as long as you don't use any of the instructions on shared memory, you are, you are still guaranteed to have deterministic behavior. Um, 
So all this is uh, actually defined in terms of a completely formal specification, a mathematical specification of the language and its validation and its execution. And this is this formal specification is actually an integral part of the whole WebAssembly design process. So if you want to add a feature to WebAssembly, you have to come up with a formal definition of it and you have to integrate it into the existing formalism. Um, and this is, again, not just something that we have on paper, it's actually something that has been mechanized in, in theorem provers like Isabel and machine verified. So the correctness of uh, the WebAssembly specification is machine verified. And this is kind of like a prerequisite if you want to do more sophisticated things in, in the area of safety and security and, and verification. For example, you want to verify a full software stack to um, to know about certain uh, security properties or other safety properties, then you need to have such a specification. Um, and WebAssembly provides one as part of its official language specification. So here's like a little picture just uh, because I had so much text um, kind of displaying how, how the, the state of a WebAssembly program looks like. So on the upper part is basically, basically the user state, the application state, which is accessible to code. And that is really mainly the linear memory. So you have these, this array of bytes, you can access that, but that's really all you can do. It has a, an upper size limit and anything outside you cannot access. And then fully encapsulated, you have the engine state, which contains all these things like the call stack, the function code, um, and something I didn't mention, it's called indirect function table, which allows you to do indirect uh, calls. But all you can see there from, from the code is just a bunch of indices. So none of this is exposed to actual code. And this is how it should be, obviously. So none of this should really be surprising, I hope. <laughs> um, so this is one part, that's the part of WebSemi that kind of ensures safety. The other part that is interesting in the context of security is how WebAssembly programs are deployed. And that is uh, in terms of modules. So every WebAssembly binary is actually defining a module and the module has imports and exports. And th there are no other means to share WebAssembly code than through modules. Um, and this, this notion of module then provides both encapsulation and, and sandboxing abilities. So how is that? So there are two main features uh, that a module has. They are imports and imp exports, uh, as you might expect. So imports are some, something that a client has to supply when it's using a module. And by this way, the ability of the client to actually supply these imports explicitly, it can control them, right? So and because imports are the only way that a module can actually interact with the environment, like very unlike JavaScript, for example, where you have the global object and all the pre mod aisles, which give you plenty of side channels through which uh, even a, a JavaScript module can communicate with others. None of that exists in WebAssembly. You can only go through imports. So there are no ambient capabilities whatsoever. WebAssembly code by itself cannot do anything other than heating up your CPU. Any ability to access your computing environment, your host environment, has to be provided uh, through imports, and the client controls those. And this is how trivially you enable sandboxing, basically. Um, and dually, a module has exports, and um, it can specify which of its definitions, internal definitions, is exported, and everything it, that is not exported is guaranteed to be fully private. There's no way that the client code can access the private parts of a module. So it goes both ways, right? Um, and so for example, you can have private globals, functions, and even a memory in WebAssembly can be private to a module. So a module can have a private memory that no other module is gonna be able to access. Um, and there's no way to circumvent this, right? It's built directly into the language semantics. And yeah, this is what gives you encapsulation essentially because you only expose what, what you want to expose. Um, so modules themselves is like the binaries you get, they are just like a stateless thing, right? They're just like a description really of some code and some interface. To actually use it, you have to instantiate a module and then you get something we call an instance. So modules themselves are stateless, but instances are now like have local state in them, like the memory or some globals that you create when you instantiate it. 
And a module can be instantiated any number of time if you want. And if you instantiate it, you have to supply the imports. And when you do so, you get back the instance and that gives you the, the exports. So if you want, a module is really a function from imports to exports and instantiation is applying this function. And once you have that idea, then linking modules is kind of like a straightforward thing. You really just keep applying uh, these module functions to the result of other functions. So you perform linking via instantiation. At each step, you have a mod, you have a module, you instantiate with some imports, and you can use the the exports of prior instantiations uh, to as imports for other for later modules. You can also use uh, you can also supply some host functionality as an import. So if the host environment in which WebAssembly runs uh, provides such functionality. So for example, on the web, you can use any JavaScript function, which would be host functionality from the perspective of WebAssembly and pass it as an import to a WebAssembly module so that it can call it as if it was a WebAssembly function itself. And this is the way you actually give WebAssembly access to the web API, for example. There's no other way it can access it. Um, yeah, and this way of, of plugging modules together through explicit instantiation and linking provides a way to uh, and it, like express various like security policies if you want. Just like a couple of examples here, for example, in, imports can be used to implement like principle of uh, least authority, right? So if you have an, a module that you want to instantiate it that you don't fully trust, you just provide the minimally capable imports to it that it needs to function. Um, or more generally, you can fully virtualize some of the dependencies that the module has. So if, if it wants to import something and you don't want to give it that, you just give it like a virtual uh, replacement for that, that functionality. So for a more concrete example, you just imagine you have an application and this application imports some uh, library, like for example, for compression. Um, so there would be some other WebAssembly modu modules probably somewhere. And maybe this module also wants to be able to access the file system in some way. So all these imports are kind of like URLs. They might be accessed remotely. So the main WASM might import libzip WASM from some other site. Um, and this then imports something. So I, I use the URL sys here just to indicate that this is a system module that the host provides. So this one imports something or is in, means to import something from the system itself that gets primitive access to, to the file system, for example. And if you have these modules, you have to write some, you have to do some, some linking by instantiating these modules in the right order. So first you acquire the system module in some way, and then you plug it in into these other modules like layer from the bottom up on each layer. And this glue code on the web, for example, it would be written in JavaScript, right? So JavaScript is what you express this in right now on the web. Um, but now what, what is what is the scenario where you might want to do sandboxing, for example? Imagine um, this libzip wasm is something you acquire remotely, so you don't fully trust it. You don't fully trust that it, it does not evil things because you know it has access to this file system, so this might be dangerous. So you want to revoke that access or not give it to it in the first place. Um, and you, one way to do this is to virtualize the file system to actually not give it any access at all, but just give it a virtual file system module that emulates one. And you can just do that by passing in like this virtual instance of this virtualized module. But again, the, the glue code has to be written outside. Um, so this is all fine. Um, this allows you to do some level of something like sandboxing on the, on the language level. But it has some limitations. Um, so one is that all the name resolution has to be performed by this global glue code, right? That decides what modules go where, and the modules themselves have no way to control that. And it's completely outside the language if you take WebAssembly as the language. So there's no way to encapsulate it in a module how it uses its own dependencies. So in particular, um, it's completely outside the control of a library uh, how it gets instantiated and how its own dependency gets instantiated. So for example, in particular, a, a library module has no way of sandboxing its own dependencies itself. 
it has to depend on the the root like instantiator the 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 client itself to do that the right way it cannot do it itself um so in a way this means that this doesn't really compose so something is missing here um, so to make that more concrete, just imagine instead of having an application main here, we have another level of library, another library layer. Say it's an image library or something like that. Um, and then we have an application on top of that that wants to use that library. Um, and like before, you can link these together. But what, you, what I actually want to do as the author of this image library, I want to package, pro, uh, provide a package for this kind of library um, in some in some way. And now in this package, I want to encode that I want to sandbox this untrusted libzip wasm that I'm importing. So what I really want to do is I want to instantiate inside of my module. I want to be in control of that. So I want to import the virtual file system here and instantiate um, my dependency myself. And then what the global Glue code would have to do is something like this, where it supplies my two imports here, and the import to libzip now is not actually importing an instance of a module, it's importing an uninstantiated module. Uh, so I didn't make that uh, apparent from the import notation here, but yeah, just a, I'm hand waving a little bit here about syntax, obviously. And this is something we want to provide. So this is kind of like a, a one of the proposals we're working on is supposed to provide this idea. Um, so the idea is that we extend WebAssembly with the ability to import modules, not just instances. And moreover, we allow instantiation to happen inside the language, so inside a module. And also we allow definitions of modules to be nested into other modules and also definitions of instances so that you, you can fully close over anything you want in this, in this layering. Um, and we kind of like Luke Wagner from Mozilla, he started out with these ideas and designed something and then he came to me and we iterated over it a number of times. And at some point we realized that we actually had just reinvented something that is very close to the ML module system. So if you're familiar with ML or Camel, um, that is a family of languages that has a very sophisticated higher order module system. So where you can parameterize modules over other modules and so on and so forth. And the proposal in the end turned out to be almost exactly a translation of ML modules to WebAssembly. And for me, as somebody who has done uh, a lot of research on modules, this was pretty exciting to see that, oh, actually, we didn't try to find a use case for modules. We tried to do something and then we ended up, oh, we actually want exactly this. Um, so this doesn't exist yet, but there's a proposal and I hope um, it's going to be there soon. And, and what this provides is what um, some researchers call a, a strong modularity. So it's not just some notion of modularity, it's strong modularity, meaning that modules cannot have any dependencies other than imports, like I explained before and that imports can be fully controlled by the client of a module. So you can control how it's instantiated. Um, and this is, from my perspective, from like a language kind of angle, it's the, the foundation for things like sandboxing, for expressing sandboxing in capability-based architectures. And yeah, hopefully this is coming to WESM. I didn't write soon here because it might take some time, but we're working on it. So like as a punchline here, and this is obviously grossly oversimplifying, completely ignoring other kinds of issues like Spectre that uh, Chris was talking about, but like from a purely architectural language kind of angle, I, I wanna drive home this equation that I think security or at least enabling security is like the combination of safety built into the language and strong modularity built into the language. Yeah, and I think with that slide, I'll pass on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Andreas, for that very interesting talk. Um, and thanks for the audience for, for uh, typing your questions into the chat. Um, as a reminder, we'll collect those questions and then have a full-fledged Q&A at the end. And now our last speaker for today, I'm pleased to introduce Ben Lipschitz, who is a reader, which for those of you not, uh, in Europe is an associate professor plus plus at Imperial College London. He's an affiliate professor at the University of Washington. He was previously at Microsoft Research, 
And now he is the chief scientist for Brave Software, the maker of a novel web browser with built-in ad blocking, with the aim of giving you faster, more secure, and privacy-preserving experiences. Ben. Um, thanks very much for the introduction. I, I hope you can hear me relatively clearly. So it's great to be here. It's good to see so many familiar faces and, and, uh, and the team's window. So um, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. I'll, I'll talk about privacy as opposed to security, and uh, I'll uh, talk about uh, the interplay that's probably fairly familiar to you, which is the interplay between you know, research and uh, production and getting things uh, shipped and our experience of uh, having done that over the past two and a half, three years or so as uh, the research team at uh, Brave. So, um, in terms of, uh, I mean, there is there is a handful of browsers that focus on the end user privacy, but in terms of, uh, you know, the scale of deployment, Brave is, I think, by far the biggest. So, just about a month ago, we hit about 20 million monthly users. And so that's that's actually quite exciting, and uh, that uh, both gives us um, you know some further room to scale, but also creates an interesting platform for experimentation. Uh, so we both need to have something robust and reliable that we can continuously ship and uh, kind of push into production. But uh, also we are quite willing and able to push the envelope, and this is where you know it comes to basically some of these bleeding edge features that come out of uh, research ideas and so on and so forth. And so as part of this talk, I'll kind of highlight some of these research angles and give you some specific examples uh, of that here and there as uh, time permits, so to speak. But um, it's kind of an interesting, I mean, again, I'll talk about, I'll focus on, in some sense, uh, pretty much a single aspect, which has to do with the end uh, user privacy. But, uh, you know, it might seem like a relatively narrow angle, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to highlight how there's quite a number of interesting aspects that uh, this really flushes out as you think about the problem and find uh, interesting level of, levels of depth in it as well. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the web browser is uh, pretty much uh, uh, a window to the internet for the end user, isn't that right? Especially if the user is stuck at home during COVID or something like that. You know, basically that's their primary outlet for uh, finding information out there and so on and so forth. And uh, I don't really want to spend very much time focusing on uh, tracking and privacy violations that uh, come from uh, third-party ads by and large, and because there has been really quite an quite a lot written about that. I mean, many presentations, you know, things like ideas like surveillance capitalism and so on and so forth. So I'm kind of going to assume that you've seen some of that somewhere else. So I don't really want to spend, I have a handful of slides on that, but I really don't want to spend any more time on this. I think we should not worry about that quite as much. I think we should focus on, you know, the future, so to speak, and uh, what we can do about that. And so what the browser does out of the gate for the end users, basically this. And what I did is just clicked on uh, this little icon next to the URL bar and shows some information about this specific website, which is the international version of uh, uh, CNN, CNN.com. So it shows that it's it's got uh, quite a handful, some dozens of trackers and uh, uh, ads blocked on the site. Uh, there is no need for HTTPS connections, doesn't block any scripts, and doesn't do anything about fingerprinting. And so as we go through this talk, I'll highlight interesting aspects about this little uh, you know, black box that you see in front of you, because in many ways, this is sort of a, uh, how should I put it, a shield essential, and that's what we call these things, shields, right? That the user can put in front of them to protect them against some of the negative privacy violating aspects of the web at large, and as we know it currently. So I also should highlight that uh, we actually uh, publicized the majority of the work that I'm going to highlight here, as well as uh, the majority of the work that goes into some of these privacy preserving or privacy enhancing uh, features that I'm going to mention today. So you can see some of these papers if you go to the URL that's mentioned on this slide. So in the last six or seven months, we've had papers in uh, Oakland, USNIX, WWW, CHI, Sigmetric. So we really have done uh, quite well in terms of publicizing this kind of uh, research. And I'm only going to focus, as I said, on some of these things that have to do with uh, tracking protection, ad blocking, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
So let's start with some of the practical bits, because I think we sort of need to understand, uh, you know, how engineers think about the problem. And this is kind of where we started with this as well. Right. So uh, this this business of shield, this is what I showed to you before. Essentially, if you expand that, you'll see these various aspects in terms of trackers and upgrades and so on and so forth. So I'll go through these things uh, one at a time and uh, mention a few things here and there. So first uh, and perhaps foremost, uh, how are these trackers and ads blocked in the first place? I mean, the dirty truth behind most ad blockers is that this is actually a crowdsourced process. So there's a handful of uh, manually curated or crowdsourced lists of URLs effectively, as well as some wildcards and things of that sort. And probably the most uh, widely known of these is called EasyList. If you go to easylist.to, you'll see what it is. There is another one called Easy Privacy, And then there's quite a handful of others. So there's something called Disconnect. Uplock Origin has its own list, as well as uh, things that we have developed at Brave. So in a sense, I mean, you know, as computer scientists, we would love to automate everything, right, in principle. But turns out that this process of manual curated list creation and updating and removing elements of these lists, and just to give you a sense of scale, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of URLs that are on some of these lists, right? So these are gigantic, you know, entry, entries that are entities rather that are discussed on various forums and are updated, you know, certainly daily, if not hourly, by uh, individuals, experts who decide to spend, you know, spend their time and volunteer their time on these activities. And actually, that's not a bad starting point, as it turns out. And that's the starting point for pretty much every single ad blocker that's out there. Now, that's not really the end, because I mean, you know, if you just basically finish there, then you're not really competing with others. And as it turns out, there is quite a lot of competition among the different ad blockers. So I mentioned a couple of them, I think, at Block Plus. You block origin. Turns out there's actually pretty stiff competition across these products. And I mean, the quality of blocking and the false positives as well as false negatives is actually what you have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a very direct way. And so we've designed, uh, you know, I mean, we've, I mean, I'll, I'm highlighting some of the papers here that actually have to do with the quality of uh, these block lists. So we've looked at how these things are expanded, who updates them, why, how, how precisely, what happens if people add things that are breaking websites, for example, what happens if uh, people forget to add things on time, you know, what are the implications? So that turns out there is, you know, really quite an active ecosystem underneath that. So if you're curious, you know, look at the paper on the left. And uh, it turns out that I mentioned like the manual approach and I highlighted that. And I think, you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think you need to have bits of automation and you also need to have a little bit of manual help or a kind of human provided help. And so this is what the second uh, paper is uh, largely about. So where we basically uh, try to uh, understand uh, filter list evasion and try to deal with it and try to automatically combat, combat that. And that's a paper that's coming out, I think, in Oakland next year. So if you're interested in that, take a look. And uh, I mean, things get uh, even more, uh, in some sense, esoteric and uh, uh, fascinating uh, because it turns out that, again, I mean, uh, uh, advertisers, uh, some of them are really quite adventurous and uh, they know that they're being blocked and they try to come up with interesting ways to dodge that, to basically avoid being blocked. And so we've come up with ways that involve things like uh, deep learning and whatnot that look at the images that are displayed on the screen, which is after all what's shown to the end user, and use these models that we've trained at scale to basically find um, ads that might not have been blocked by one of these block lists that I mentioned before. And this is a kind of thing where, you know, we can publish this paper, but it turns out that deploying this at scale is still probably too fragile because of various things that have to do with false positives that we uh, are probably okay for publication, but we're not quite comfortable deploying this at scale. And so this is the kind of thing that we actually use for testing, right? So it's good to have some uh, strategy for testing what you have. And this is one of the approaches that we use for exactly that. Uh, what you see on the right is a problem that, as the name might suggest, it hasn't received so far nearly as much attention because, I mean, while something like EasyList focuses on English and advertising network that serve the English-speaking world, 
When it comes to uh, smaller uh, countries, let's say, and languages that don't have as many speakers, uh, the situation is not nearly as robust when it comes to the upkeep of these block lists. And so we've designed strategies to basically both measure, uh, you know, the gap in terms of what needs to be in the block list and to automatically enhance some of these uh, block lists for languages that are not as widely uh, supported in terms of, uh, you know, block list automation or block list, you know, upkeep, I should say, but at the same time have plenty of brave browser users whom we also want to protect as part of this effort. So back to my little cheat sheet here, which is, you know, back to the Shields uh, dialog box that drops down from your screen. And so the next thing so far, there's no need to do an HTTPS upgrade. And this is something that I mean, it's a pretty old idea. I don't think we are kind of reinventing anything that's particularly new here. So this one is quite easy. I'm going to just skip that. If you want to find out more, go to the EFF URL that's shown here, and that'll they'll tell you about HTTPS everywhere and things like that. So the next thing is, uh, well, OK, we're not really blocking uh, JavaScript, right? Because doing so, by and large, would be quite a dangerous value proposition because much of the time it's going to break the underlying website because a lot of the site's functionality relies on JavaScript. We know that, right? So it turns out that this is not a particularly excellent idea. But if you think about this long and hard, I think you'll be able to come up with some sort of an interesting trade-off, some sort of a middle ground between essentially uh, preventing things that would be privacy violating, especially in the context of third party libraries. Because after all, I mean, the way the web is designed is that you can basically include a third party library from some sort of a CDN, for example. You don't really know too much about that library, perhaps, maybe almost nothing, in fact. And after all, that library can also change after you've tested it. So there's a time of check, time of use problem here on top of everything as well. So it turns out that there is an interesting strategy that if you really understand the way JavaScript works, as well as the resources within the browser, it touches such as the DOM and, you know, things like local storage and whatnot, session storage, things of that sort, you will be able, as the name of this kind of outline of a paper, which we're actually currently working on, suggests, carve out out of a large body of third-party code, the skeleton, so to speak, that preserves the functionality, yet removes features or extra stuff, so to speak, that might actually lead to privacy violations, right? And so that's roughly uh, the intuition behind this paper. That is to say, instead of blocking JavaScript, which we know for a fact is very likely to break the majority of websites that kind of need buttons to work and need, you know, the hover action to do something that the hover action does and needs X XHR, uh, uh, network transfers to complete and be handled by, you know, a bit of JavaScript there as well, right? So breaking, you know, removing JavaScript is just basically a very crude, very uh, sort of basic option, right? So this suggests a strategy that gives you kind of that middle ground, so to speak, which uh, preserves the privacy or enhances the privacy while uh, preserving the functionality. And that's a very typical trade-off here, right? So trying to block too much will make things run faster, but will also break things a lot more and a lot more so than we are willing because clearly if you break things too much then users will complain they'll be unhappy they'll come back to us and you know we'll have to deal with it one way or another so um yeah so then there's this other business of uh, cross-site uh, cookies and cross-site storage in a more general sense and i'm not going to go into the intricacies of that there's really quite a lot here in terms of uh, cookies that are set by javascript different lifetime lifetimes uh, lifetime considerations around that and so on and so forth i mean this stuff gets complicated very quickly so i don't think i necessarily want to spend that much time on that i'll mention it in passing later on let me talk about something else, which is fingerprinting protection and fingerprinting prevention. And this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I did some work about, you know, around this or related to this about six or seven years ago now. And at that time, again, it was one of those topics that was like, ah, this is a fun research activity, but really we don't really see that in practice, so probably not so important. Turns out that we actually see a ton of this in practice nowadays. We see a great deal of uh, fingerprinting that's happening in practice because in part of browsers uh, blocking uh, third-party cookies quite aggressively, and also because of protections uh, on the legal front, such as GDPR and various other uh, legislative kind of uh, acts that have to do with the end user's privacy. So it turns out that fingerprinting is quite 
rampant. In fact, if you go and measure it, and there have been quite a number of measurements out there uh, that others, other researchers have done as well. There are other things that, you know, these shields do for us, like, you know, removing uh, query parameters and things of that sort. I'm not going to go into that. That's uh, much more on the practical side of where we start them. So let's talk about some of this a little bit more. So in terms of fingerprinting protection, let me kind of highlight some of the ideas. You probably have seen or you probably have seen uh, examples or you probably know the idea behind fingerprinting, right? So it's about basically using typically JavaScript to learn something about the end, uh, the end user setup and be able on the basis of that to identify them. It turns out that there's a variety of fingerprintable APIs such as the Canvas API, WebOdia, WebRTC, SVG, and so on and so forth. And um, I mean, what does one do? Right, again, as we said before, you know, one can disable these things wholesale, in which case, is well, the Canvas API will not work, you know, the games and things like that will not work in the browser anymore, and some people will be probably unhappy. So question is, how do you basically do this in a way that minimizes the breakage while reducing the fingerprinting surface of the browser? And so what we uh, have uh, after a while shifted towards is this idea that we call farbling. And what farbling is, is a form of minor randomization to confuse fingerprinters. And so the observation that is uh, in this paper that you see on the right, this is not a paper of ours, this is from another uh, another place, another university. So the idea here is that anonymization through generalization, that is to say making everybody look the same, does not sufficiently protect anonymity. And so it turns out that providing different fingerprinting every time by virtue of randomization for every session, for example, is actually quite a bit more effective. And this is the insight, in fact, we had in this paper that uh, I worked on about five or six years ago. And so this is actually what we've implemented. And this is running in the browser. By now it's running in the production versions of the browser as well. You, if you are running Brave, you'll basically have this working on your behalf. And so uh, effectively, I mean, you can see in the right on the right side of the slides about some of these ideas about uh, noise addition and things of that sort and how to make recovery of true values a little bit more difficult. Again, we probably don't have too much time to talk about that, but it turns out that the fingerprinting surface of a modern browser is huge. And this is kind of a gift that keeps on giving, so to speak. So over the last six months or so, we've added more and more protections, one on top of another in terms of fingerprinting, roughly using the same sort of ideas, but basically raising the bar a little bit uh, higher every time for uh, the potential fingerprint or for the potential attacker in this case. A little bit about so some of these other things that have to do with uh, storage. So I already mentioned some of these complications that have to do with uh, uh, third, par uh, third party sorry, uh, storage for things like cookies, but not only cookies, right? It's other types of storage APIs, such as local, store, local, ses uh, local storage as well as session storage. And the question here is like, what do you do? And again, it's kind of roughly the same balancing act, which I keep mentioning, which is we want to reduce the privacy downsides while not breaking too many things, right? And of course, it's quite difficult to understand what we break in the precise way. So we have a handful of techniques to do so in a way that's a little bit more fuzzy, yet still quite effective. And so we've come up with this idea of what we call ephemeral storage. And uh, I don't think, again, I have to, that much time to basically uh, talk about this. But I mean, the way to think about it is that essentially it's pageless storage. And we use these ideas around, uh, you know, effectively dual keying um, kind of storage attribution. Some of these ideas go back to some of these discussions with other browser vendors and committee meetings and things like that that we particip uh, participate in. But this is the kind of thing that we've basically extracted after months of design and kind of measurement work where it kind of achieves the delicate balance that I keep coming back to. All right, so I only have a few minutes to summarize this and I think I only need a few minutes anyway, but uh, okay, so the way I think about this, so the way I've structured this talk is to kind of highlight this interplay that I like to highlight uh, between, you know, uh, practice and uh, research and how the two meet each other and when and under what circumstances. And so uh, I started with a relatively simple looking problem, right? It sounds like, you know, just blocking trackers and uh, ads. I mean, you have easy list. Look at how 
I don't know, Adblock Plus does it and can kind of, you know, that's that's what you do. Turns out that just the beginning of that story turns out that the further you push that envelope, the more interesting problems reveal themselves. And there's quite a, an interesting research agenda one can form on the basis of that. And in a certain sense, that's the angle that I keep highlighting here. That's in a lot of ways, that's what we've done here. So again, I'll mention that URL if you want to go and look at some of these papers. There are papers there that pertain to other aspects of what we do at Brave, and but this specific angle is mentioned there also. So um, I talked about filter lists and the upsides and downsides of having something that's ultimately manually managed or crowdsourced. I think that's an interesting you know, set of trade-offs. Uh, um, sometimes you need that, but that's probably not the end of the story, which is why we start with that and then figure out ways to do automation. So we've come up with an idea or a data structure we call page graph, and we've shared this. Uh, this was from Oakland last year. We've shared this with other researchers, especially academic researchers who want to do work in this space. That's all. So uh, let me see. I think that's probably all I wanted to say. So let me stop here and uh, I'm happy to take questions later on. Thanks so much, Ben. All right, so we've now reached um, the end of the remarks of our three speakers, and so we have an opportunity to interact. Uh, thanks to those of you who have already typed your questions into the chat. Keep doing that, and um, I'll read the questions off um, going between the different speakers. Also, if you would like to ask a question in real time, you can use the raise hand feature. It's at the top of your panel. Uh, when I recognize you, you can be unmuted by our moderators, and then you have to unmute yourself, and you can ask your question. Okay, so let's go to um, the first question. Uh, Brian Parno has one for Charlie. Uh, he asks, absent specter-like attacks, would software fault isolation style isolation, rather than process isolation, be tempting? In other words, would it simplify certain compatibility constraints? Yeah, thanks for the question. So I think that uh, SFI style isolation is nice uh, from a like resource usage perspective that you don't end up having to pay quite as much uh, memory cost for an extra process. Um, it doesn't quite help as much with the compatibility constraints because it's still difficult to move something like, for example, if it changes document that domain from one SFI region to another one that might end up merging with another existing uh, SFI region, but uh, you also sort of, you know, hit the nail on the head with the specter-like attack aspect, where we we do care about the fact that the memory from one SFI region might leak, um, given that these attacks can't run in JavaScript. Uh, but I will say that we are looking at cases where uh, this sort of isolation can be useful. You know, one case might be uh, on like low-resource Android devices where um, we are constrained by memory and it would be nice to have at least some level of isolation between um, different instances in the same process uh, and that does require some extra architecture work to like make it possible to run multiple renders in the same process but we're doing some of that work anyway we're sort of looking at independent scheduling of uh, things within the rendering engine uh, and then there's also, you know, there's like interesting papers like the RL box paper uh, from the, the past year from Mozilla that look at SFI style sandboxing of particular libraries within the browser. Uh, and that in itself may be something interesting to explore. Cool, thank you. Okay, so now I have a question uh, for Andreas from Claudio Russo, who asks, first, is there a CompCert WASM backend? Uh, for those of you who don't know, CompCert is a Prove to be correct C compiler. And uh, yeah, I wonder if there's a connection with Wasm there. Um, by ComCert backend, you mean something WebAssembly compiling th to native code through ComCert or ComCert compiling into WebAssembly? Um, you could comment on both. <laughs> uh, actually, I think there's neither. So maybe <laughs> the answer is simple, but it, it would be great to see. I, I actually heard rumors about some people being interested in having a WebAssembly backend for for ComCert, but I don't know any any concrete details about that. Okay. Okay, and then he asks another question, which is, um, you made this nice connection between Wasm um, modules and the use of namespaces and whatnot to uh, enforce security. And he wonders, um, is a Wasm module a ML functor? And is a Wasm instance an ML structure, for those in the know? 
of course he would be asking that. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> that's exactly the, the, the analogy. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, next um, I have a question for Ben. Um, so you mentioned, this is a question for me now, uh, you mentioned potentially brittle approaches that maybe you carry out in research that aren't quite ready for full deployment. They're maybe a bit too brittle, but you said that they're good for testing. So I, I wonder if you can elaborate on what you mean by that. Well, it's it's very common that you have uh, situations where there is no fundamental. It's very difficult to figure out the ground truth, right? You use multiple classifiers uh, to basically triangulate uh, uh, sort of different uh, uh, boundaries of where the ground truth might be, so to speak, right? So you look at disagreements across classifiers, and this is where having more classifiers is very helpful, right? So it's, I mean, we've done studies of different ad blockers to basically figure out where they disagree, and those tend to be very interesting, right? We've done studies, I mean, where they all agree is actually usually quite boring, but looking at uh, places where they disagree is usually quite fascinating. If you have the ability to run these things in isolation, so to speak, as one would be with a deep learning thing that basically looks at images, just captures screenshots and looks at images, it's also great. If you are able to have a very different approach, that is to say one that relies on the visual appearance of something, as opposed to an approach that relies on, let's say, the structure or the underlying you know, execution trace or something about uh, the runtime behavior of JavaScript or what have you, usually it's actually a good thing, right? It's good to have that diversity when it comes to understanding these classifiers and finding differences. I, I wonder um, whether you might also, whether uh, this probably is a standard practice, but I'm curious if you follow it, do you do a uh, rolling deployment of uh, things that you feel maybe are on the edge of being effective, maybe only some brave browser users end up getting a certain feature and then you take telemetry to see how well it's working before you do a full rollout? Uh, yeah, very much so. So we have nightly, we have dev, we have uh, what is it, beta and we have release and uh, that's again very common. Uh, although the one bit that you mentioned then is actually a lot more difficult than you might imagine, which is taking telemetry in a privacy preserving browser is exceedingly <laughs> difficult. Right. So we've built a privacy preserving um, approaches to telemetry that actually rely on differential privacy of all things. Uh, but uh, that sometimes has limitations too. But in principle, you're almost right. But in practice, one has to be very careful there. Got it, okay, thank you. Okay, so I have another question for Charlie. This is from Yassi Oren. He says, thanks for a fascinating talk. Some of your security upgrades break the web, uh, disabling Flash as an example. When you consider one of these disruptive changes, how does your internal process at Google balance compatibility and security? Yeah, that is a very important question. And it's something that we do uh, take very seriously. We don't want to cause a lot of pain for web developers. Uh, we actually have a pretty well documented public uh, intent to deprecate process and things on breaking changes, uh, which you can find at chromium.org. Uh, there's a page called Removing Features that links to all the different considerations that go into deprecating a web API from you know something small uh, that has low usage to you know larger things like flash and what considerations go into that. So you know for some things it might look at some of our telemetry for how often this feature is used in various page visits and making sure that that's some extraordinarily small amount before we try and take it away, which is one of the reasons why it's difficult for us to like remove document.domain, even though it has pretty low usage at this point. We would still need to work with more sites to move away from that. And then for larger things like Flash, um, it really is a like multi-year process in trying to move things to be you know incremental, that it's sort of like click to play at first and then disable by default and then don't remove it for a while after that. Uh, but ultimately it is sort of, you know, we view the web as a living platform and things do move forward. Uh, and uh, we are hopeful that we can make progress on these fronts and in cases where it, it matters a lot for uh, browser security or for other reasons. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I have a question for Andreas, which is about uh, this idea of using import exports to control access to sensitive uh, resources. It's sort of a, a namespace thinning kind of approach. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the analogy in like uh, object-oriented languages where you could make uh, 
getters and setters, uh, private methods, and so the outside people can't call it. But then what happens is that those private fields that you were protecting by uh, blocking access to their getter and setter end up getting leaked indirectly, maybe through something else, some other method that's called, or um, even directly, maybe just the internal data structure is leaked. Is there any um, support in WebAssembly for dealing with that kind of problem? I'm not sure I understand the scenario. So you're saying leaking them through some other method in an object or? I guess that what I'm thinking is that namespace control is kind of first order and that there are ways that you can capture state that end up leaking out um, through namespaces. If I'm thinking of higher order functions in ML or things like this, that maybe you don't provide direct access to something, but you end up uh, making it available nevertheless through something that you do provide access to. Well, sure. I mean, I guess um, you still have to be careful what you export, right? Like if you export something that still exposes this information in some other way, maybe indirectly, um, there's nothing that in the language that will protect you from that, from a mistake like that, if, if it was un unintentional. But if if you're careful, at least you can enforce it. Uh, I guess that's that's like similar to like at least safe object oriented language. Unfortunately, actual real object oriented languages barely provide any protection whatsoever. Usually they are like C++ is unsafe anyway, but even Java and I think C Sharp as well allow you to circumvent these protections through reflection, for example. Not sure about C Sharp, but I'm sure about Java. And this is not possible, at least in WebAssembly. So. OK. I was thinking because of things like uh, you were saying there's no code pointers and some of the other abstractions in the language might attenuate some of these other vectors a little bit, but um, obviously there's no free lunch. Yeah, I mean, basically you, you can think of a module as an object as well, right? It's usually a bit more larger and more cost grained, but um, all the functions you export basically close over the state of the module. Um, so you are ultimately, you ultimately have the same problem. Okay. Um, let's see, another um, comment from the chat, uh, for those of you who aren't watching that, uh, Nick Swamy said, I found it curious that Ben mentioned the usefulness of randomization, farbling, for fingerprinting protection, while Andreas emphasizes the importance of determinism uh, for being able to reason about security in WASM. So would, for example, running WASM in Brave break some of WASM's determinism um, guarantees? I guess that's for Andreas. Um, so if it breaks WASM's determinism guarantees, it would just break its semantics. It would just not be correct, right? So I don't think it has much leeway of doing it. It could still randomize NANDs. That's all it can do, um, really. the Yeah, I, I fear our hands are tied. Say that again, Ben. I think our hands are tied. I don't think we can do anything there. No, we're not touching that. <laughs> OK. That, that's a very interesting tension. Um, OK, I have a question for uh, for Charlie, which is the this this, um, you know, many, many years um, process of retrofitting this change into Chrome sounds grueling and painful. Uh, but I imagine it's it's something it's it's a process that other folks might also be facing with their own legacy applications. They've got something that's that they've been working on for 10 years. They know it's got some problem. They know that process isolation or using a safe language or uh, using a new library rather than an old one that has a very different API might improve their security, but they're worried about getting from here to there. And the big hump of not having anything that works maybe in the meantime. So I wonder just from a software engineering perspective, if you can offer any general lessons about what was maybe surprisingly successful about this retrofit, um, you know, any any comments that are of general interest there? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so I, one of the topics that I mentioned in the talk was this finding some intermediate milestones that uh, make it possible to get wins along the way before you have to tackle everything. And for Chrome, we had a couple of uh, intermediate stages that we could lean towards um, more process isolation without having to do the whole multi-year effort uh, that really mattered for us. And for example, 
uh, Chrome has some privileged pages like settings and so on that were very important to improve the process isolation between those and normal renderer processes long before we tried to attack out of process iframes. And with out of process iframes, uh, yes, there was a lot of architecture work to get that um, functional to begin with. Uh, but then before turning that on for web pages, we were able to turn it on for extensions. And that meant that uh, one, it solved an important security problem for us because extensions are privileged. But two, we didn't have to have everything working, like printing and dev tools, uh, things like that weren't quite up to uh, full functionality at that point, but it allowed us to get experience with that. And so finding these intermediate milestones uh, made a big difference. You gave a good example too of another one where like using a safe language, um, is is a tricky one right it's like we would love to have like the entire browser process or you know ideally everything in a safe language at this point um but finding a way to get there incrementally is a is a tough challenge and you know finding the right approaches uh whether that's starting with um changing how you handle pointers in c plus plus as an incremental step towards um maybe safer approaches later on uh but it's it's definitely a hard problem and you know not one solution is going to fit everything Got it. Cool. Thanks. Um, let's see. I have another question for uh, Andreas. I was thinking about when you mentioned threads are not part of Wasm now, but they are um, in process. And I, I I wonder why you want them. Uh, why not message passing processes that are separate and isolated? I mean, I'm thinking about your um, careful control of namespaces with exports and modules and everything else. Why do I now want multiple threads? I presume shared memory concurrency. Why do I want that instead of having a similar sort of isolation by the start approach, but with separate threads of control? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, personally, I don't want them. <laughs> but of course, WebAssembly is supposed to be a compilation target for a large variety of language, ideally every language out there. And there's a lot of pressure to be able to compile existing like C, C++ code with pthreads into WebAssembly. And this is basic, is actually the, the biggest hurdle right now for cross compiling existing desktop apps to WebAssembly that you can't really do threads. You can't even emulate them. So yeah, it's just one of these realities that you have to provide something like that unfortunately <laughs> and it, it brings with it all the pains of like weak memory models and all that nonsense right <laughs> yeah yeah actually this makes me wonder as well this kind of trade-off of you have to provide uh, sufficient levels of functionality to motivate people to use your platform um, but at the same time you want to provide security it's the age-old trade-off i was wondering the same thing ben about uh, brave that on the one hand, uh, people like to eliminate ad blockers, but on the other hand, ad blockers, you know, uh, fund the web. So I know that uh, I think Brave has some mechanisms for more direct funding, but I wonder how you approach that question. Uh, how much privacy is, is too much privacy uh, from the perspective of supporting the, the overall endeavor? Yeah, there's a lot of subtlety here, and I could talk about that for quite a while. I don't think I don't think this is necessarily. Uh, I mean, I think mine is limited to respond to this at the same time. So, there is indeed an alternative model that we are providing to in fact compensate the end user for engagement, and, uh, and we do that through a cryptocurrency called Basic Attention Token or BAT. Um, we try to turn the model really on its on its head here. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, there are there is uh, really quite a multitude of interesting corner cases, right? I mean, all the way from uh, paywalls, and we've actually studied the prevalence of paywalls. Looks like something like fifty-two percent, I think, from our measurements of top news sites out of a thousand or so top news websites use some form of a paywall, right? And so, completely tearing that down and just blocking everything maybe is not you know the most subtle of moves let's say right so there are perhaps reasons to have that and so we have a system to compensate publishers and we have what is it over hundred thousand a hundred thousand publishers who have actually stepped into this during the program and now are getting a bet through brave every single month uh but um 
clearly not everybody has done that. And clearly there are, let's say, some of these pay sites with paywalls that have that. So ultimately, uh, I mean, there's no simple answer to this question. The user is uh, uh, deciding what they want to do. They can choose to disable shields on a particular site, and that's a sticky kind of setting. So next time they go, we'll not do anything about it. They can even uh, toggle individual trackers, I believe, within the shields if they want, if they understand what those things mean. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, look, I think it's about providing a sensible default and then ways to uh, recover if the sensible default doesn't all this work. I think yeah. as the monetization for for the web shifts from what it has been over the past. Uh, uh, decades or two, I think we'll be able to adjust our posture uh, as well uh, with relative ease. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Um, okay, I have another question for Andreas. This one is from Brian Parno. Uh, he asks, can you talk a bit about the motivation behind the various control flow constructs in WASM, particularly the ability to have multi-level breaks? He says, we've been developing a verified compiler from WASM to X64 and found that those constructs created a number of hairy corner cases. That's interesting. Um, usually people complain about jumps not being general or powerful enough. <laughs> First time I hear complain <laughs> in the opposite direction. So just for a little bit of background, WebAssembly doesn't have arbitrary jumps. It just has basically a coolant of breaks and go-tos, but with labels, so you can break out several levels. Um, so it's still structured control flow. And this is something you act, I think you want. There are many use cases where you want to break out more than one level. It's also just a basic compositionality uh, feature. So you want to be able to substitute some code uh, where you, you still want to be able to jump to the same label you were able to, from some other context, regardless of whether there's something in between. Um, so I'm not sure this, it would be feasible to, to not have that ability. And most languages, as far as I can tell, that don't have arbitrary go to have at least this, like JavaScript would be one example, right? Like, like imperative languages anyway. Um, so I, yeah, I, I wonder what difficulties it causes. I'm not sure I can, I have a good feeling. Maybe he'll elaborate in the, in the chat. Okay, I um, we're we're getting close to the end. I have one more um, question for me uh, for Charlie, uh, unless another one pops up, which is um, the the focus of your talk today largely has been on process based isolation as kind of the Uber mitigation approach. That it makes sense to get the operating system and to some degree the hardware to help uh, mitigate the risk of uh, a compromise, say in the rendering engine, and that's great. Uh, but there are other mitigations that you could choose to use. You talked about a few of those. Since uh, you know, we would love to be able to quantify security to be able to say this one is worth more than that one. Uh, but you know, that's that's not so easy. Nevertheless, we have to make choices. I'm curious what your process is uh, for making those choices when you improve the security of Chrome. Yeah. So we do look at um, you know past security bugs that we've had. Uh, in addition to just what opportunities are available to us. Um, so, you know, if there was many natural things that that came from the architecture choice that where we were pursuing site isolation, um, with that in place, we are looking at, um, you know, what sorts of bugs are causing uh, big security issues right now in the wild and with bugs that are reported to us. Uh, so there's some good things on uh, chromium.org that have been posted about how memory safety issues, uh, use after freeze in the browser process and so on are a big concern for us and things that we want to try to mitigate. So we are putting some attention into that. There's some, uh, as, as I was alluding to, there's some uh, work on changing how pointers work in the browser process to make exploitable use after freeze less common and make it harder to escape the sandbox that way. Um, but I would definitely say that, yeah, we, we take a look at what's happening what well, bugs are being reported to us, and when we do find things in the wild, we pay a lot of attention to that for where we should add extra lines of defense. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we've reached the end of our time. I'd like to thank the speakers uh, once again for their uh, very interesting talks, and thanks for the discussion. Thanks to you, the audience, for providing your questions. And um, I invite everyone to come back next week um, for our next speaker. I believe it's Samesh Shah who will be talking about.
um, security and machine learning. So again, um, thank you everyone. Thanks.